You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey, the host of the Wealth Formula Podcast, the podcast for wealthformula.com. I am your host, Buck Joffrey, as I mentioned, and this is the second show. Um, this show, uh, as a reminder, is a little different from other types of um, investing or uh, personal finance shows in that I'm really focusing here on those of you who actually either already have some money or you know, shortly will have some money. For example, if you're a law student or a medical student, you're still probably worthwhile for you to listen to this. If you, uh, you know, if you're not making at least seventy-five to a hundred thousand dollars a year, a lot of things that I'm going to talk about here are probably not going to be very useful. Although some things will be. I mean, I'm going to touch base on, uh, you know, lots of ways to make money that you don't have to have a lot of money to do it. Um, I'm one of the reasons um, that I'm doing this podcast is and this and this blog is because. I just love ideas on investing and, you know, I love business. I love entrepreneurship and, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I find myself wanting to talk to my friends about all the time. The problem is that most of my friends are professionals and they don't really care about this stuff. They think it's kind of boring or they don't think they have the time for it, etc. But, uh, I'm almost here as an evangelist for the cause because I see too many of my colleagues and friends working their tails off and not getting you know to where they want to be, or maybe they they're making a good living, a really good living, but they're sort of in the uh, golden handcuffs. You know, they make a a lot of money, but they also you know have a lot of overhead. Every household is like a business. You know, you have your the money coming in and the money that goes out. And, you know, there's a natural tendency for people once they start making more money uh, to spend more. And, you know, this is a uh, this is not a judgment. I mean, everybody's guilty to it to a certain extent. Uh, once you're out of college, you're certainly going to and you start making money immediately. Your lifestyle starts in, improving. And, and with that, you know, you you end up wanting a nicer place to live. You don't want to live in a dorm room anymore. You don't want to have a roommate. The next thing you know, you might, you know, get married and, and have children and then and then, and then you have to move out to the suburbs because you don't want your kids to be in the city in an apartment. You want them to run around. So now you have to have a house. And Well, where are you going to buy a house? You're going to buy a house in an area where other people like you, you know, as a professional might live and that's going to cost you a little bit more money. And then you might want to, you know, send your kids to private school. Um, you know, you can end up having a pretty substantial overhead before you know it. And you're not even living, you know, that glamorous life that you thought maybe you would once you, you know, you uh, you got done with all your schooling, etc. And this blog is, uh, or this podcast and this blog are really not about living the glamorous life. What it is, is about getting out of those golden handcuffs, getting out of, you know, as Robert Kiyosaki would say, getting out of the rat race. But I'm really focusing on people who could do it a lot easier than they than other people can. And that's people who have, um, you know, income that they don't have to use in order to pay for food or pay for, you know, where they live. Uh, people who have a little extra cash and, I want to teach you, you know, what I've learned uh, and what I think is really exciting, and that is how to make that money multiply and ultimately work for you so that you don't have to work as hard. Um, Today's show, really, though, I want to focus on one of my favorite topics. It's probably, this my favorite topic, okay? It is real estate. And before you turn the show off because you think you're not going to, you know, you don't have time for real estate and you've heard such bad things and it's scary, give me a chance here, okay? The reason I love real estate is because I don't fear it. 
most people who don't get near real estate are afraid of it. And they're afraid of it because of what they hear on the news they, about people losing money and about you know speculators, etc. They're afraid of it because they think that owning real estate means you know dealing with tenants, toilets, termites. But I'm I'm here to tell you that that that's not the case. And I know this because my dad was a real estate investor for 40 years. Uh, he's still a real estate investor over 40 years because I'm 40 and he was doing it before I was born and has made a really good living at it. And um, this is a guy who came from another country and knew nothing about, you know, the markets and all this stuff. He just used common sense and safe investing in his mind and, and ended up making uh, a lot of money in his life. You know, I went to med school and, um, you know, in college and I don't have any debt. Why? Because my dad paid for it. Now, that's an issue for you and your family. But the the big thing is that my brother and I and my sister, we don't have any debt from school because my father paid for it because he had a lot of money to do it. Um, and he did it through real estate. So anyway, let me get on with this now. So why do I love real estate? I told you I don't fear it. It doesn't have, it's not scary to me. I don't feel like it's risky. And I know it's not about tenants, toilets, termites. If it was, Donald Trump wouldn't be doing it, right? So before we get into the nuts and bolts of why I love it, I want to back up and make a, distinct, uh, make a distinction uh, between the ways that people make money through real estate, because that might be part of what scares the heck out of people? You know, the the thing is that their real estate and say apartment buildings or homes that you rent out, every one of these is a business, and you have to look at them that way. And you can you can do a lot of uh, you can make money on businesses in many different ways. Now, if you look at what we do when we invest in the stock market, for example. We're really looking to make what's called capital gains. What that means is you're hoping that the value of the money that you invested in a company goes up. Maybe your wealth manager who you know did a six-month course to become a wealth manager uh, told you that and you believed him or her. Um, ultimately, capital gains is uh, nothing more than, in, than speculation in my book. Now, real estate is no different. There is, uh, There are a lot of people who are what I would call uh, people in the capital gains space in real estate. Um, you saw this. This is what created the gigantic mess in 2008 and that we're still sort of getting ourselves out of. Essentially, what happened is people bought things that they couldn't afford. Now, Largely, what happened in 2008 has to do with people who bought homes to live in that they couldn't afford. Okay, and there was a various, there's a million reasons why that happened, and they were victimized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then there's also the issue of investors who were speculating. Okay, they had properties, they bought apartment buildings for too much money, expecting that they would eventually go up in price and therefore uh, even if it wasn't a good deal for them when they bought that you know two or three years later it would be it's like buying any stock if you don't know what you're doing and i don't and most people don't i have to just tell you i have no idea in the stock market uh, i know a little bit about you know what makes sense to me I don't like the stock market because it's too complicated for me. I am a pretty simple guy, and if I don't, uh, if I don't understand the deal, I won't invest in it. And if you've gotten where you are, you know, you make a decent living. You're probably smart enough to take some interest in this and direct, you know, your own finances, your own investments, etc. So capital gains in a nutshell, is investing in something surely for the purpose of hoping and speculating that over time it goes up in value. And that is 
the way to get yourself in trouble, not only in real estate, but in pretty much in, in any investment in my mind. If you're going to invest in the stock market, you're much better off investing in things that are going to give fixed dividends or cash flow. Um, I'm not a stock market expert. Maybe we'll have one on the show at some point. But I don't want to talk about that because it's, again, stuff I don't really get. It's too complicated. Now, uh, the reason that I like investing in real estate is because I consider it a heck of a lot less risky than speculating, not only on real estate, but speculating in the stock market. Why? Because it's easy to understand and it's pretty it's pretty predictable, except in cases where there's a complete catastrophe, which there's no way to uh, you know protect yourself other than getting some good insurance, which you can do that, of course. So when I talk about investing in real estate, what I'm talking about is investing for cash flow. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is when I invest in real estate, for the most part, I don't really care. I really don't care that much if this property that I'm buying, this apartment building that I'm buying, is going to go up in value in the next two or three years. What I'm more interested in is on a monthly basis, am I able to generate income from this property? In other words, again, apartment buildings, houses, anything you rent out like that, you have to think about them simply is an encapsulated business, okay? You just happen to be in the business of owning places where people live. And if you think about it, like any business, the income that you make, minus the operating expenses, is your profit. And it's a very simple thing. So if you buy a building or a house and rent it out for enough money so that it covers... Your expenses, whether or not you've put a mortgage on that or not, plus everything else, if you come out ahead, it's a good investment, right? Now, we can talk about what later about, you know, what is a good return on investment in real estate. My personal, uh, my personal goals, I'll tell you right now, is I don't invest in anything uh, for the most part right now that I'm going to get uh, project less than 15% cash on cash. Now, cash on cash simply means, for those of you who are new to this lingo, it means if I put down $100,000 in a given year on a pro, uh, on an investment, by the end of the year, I have to make an additional $15,000 on that investment in order to for it to be 15% cash on cash. So it's the, the amount you made divided by the amount you put in on a yearly basis. So 15% cash on cash, people will say, well, that's hard to get in the stock market. You know, you're supposed to get close to 10. You know, people aren't getting that. In fact, they're still in the negatives after what happened uh, recently. And my dad, who's been doing real estate for 40 plus years, uh, it was a buying opportunity for him. Just lots more people you know, renting out places. A lot of people made bad investments. He just bought things and made more money. Um, and I'm going to talk a lot about that, particularly, particularly, you know, um, I'm I'm happy to answer any questions if you address me on the blog. My email information and all that stuff is on the wealthformula.com blog, um, and um, and I'd love to talk to you about it. But again. Now let's keep going. Now why you know why else I love real estate investing because uh, you know I don't want to make this entire show this entire podcast about real estate. There's plenty of you know real estate shows out there, but this is something you cannot avoid if you want or you can avoid it, but you'd be foolish to avoid it if you want to make uh, you know a significant. Uh, sum of money or uh, a residual income uh, and to get out of the rat race. Why else do I love real estate? Well, I, I talk, so essentially I talked about, well, the first thing I talked about was, um, well, the first thing, the first thing to talk about here, here uh, after uh, the other things I did is tax advantages. 
So there are tons of tax advantages uh, to real estate investing. Um, First of all, everybody's probably aware of the whole idea of the mortgage interest deduction. So this is no different. You ha- you get to d- deduct, um, you know, your the interest that you pay uh, on a loan. So that's one of the tax advantages, and that one's pretty good. And I've got news too. People, some people are worried about the uh, elimination of the mortgage interest tax uh, mortgage interest uh, deduction. Well, it's virtually impossible to get rid of that deduction if you are in the business of investing in real estate because then it's a business then it's an operating cost you know the the interest deduction may go away on your personal home but i don't under, it, it's i there's it's hard to imagine how they could be justified to remove that as part of your investment because it's part of your operating costs the other item is depreciation. So anybody who's not a business owner and who you know uh, who doesn't uh, you know basically works for somebody else and gets a W two, and uh, like most most employees and most doctors, mo- most lawyers are, you know they're all they're all W two employees. Uh, this is going to be probably fairly new, but the concept of depreciation is this: is that the uh, tax code basically recognizes that when you buy equipment or you buy things for your business, assets for your business, that eventually they break down and they're no longer worthwhile. Well, it's it's a little funny, but when you buy real estate, the government sees your real estate the same way. It sees your apartment buildings the same way, and it gives you credit on a yearly basis for depreciation on that property. So, for example, say, um, you know, I'm just going to use an example. Say you bought a $100,000 home to rent out and you put $20,000 down um, or $25,000 down and somehow you ended up with, you know, you know, $10,000. $10, so that's $10,000 cash on cash, $10,000 of of positive income in that year from that property. I'm I'm not going to do the numbers here right now, but almost 100% chance that the depreciation, the amount that's deducted uh, as a loss from that building sort of uh, losing value um, in this theoretical tax world will exceed the amount of income that you got from that property if you are leveraging. So $10,000 on uh, $100,000, $10,000 or 10% return on investment sounds really uh, good to begin. But now, uh, since the depreciation offset the loss, that's really 10%, right? So you're not paying capital gains on that because, you know, at least on your your taxes, that's going to appear as... uh, something that you lost money on. And it's perfectly legal. There's nothing illegal about this. This is just the way it works. All right. Um, Now, if you are a physician or a lawyer and you're just investing, etc., you can't offset your own personal income, um, you know, from the from the losses if they exceed, uh, you know, what you made on the property, the passive losses. But you can apply them potentially to a uh, uh, two other forms of passive income. Now, I want to put the disclaimer in there that I'm not a tax professional, but this is all information that you should definitely talk to your tax professional about. And if they don't know anything about this, find a new tax professional, please, because there's a lot of bad ones out there. Now, the other uh, the other advantage. Um, we talked about depreciation. We talked about the mortgage interest deduction. Let's go back to what exactly the wealth formula is, right? So the wealth formula we talked about in the last episode, there is the, there's three main components that I like to think of, although I, as I mentioned, it's dynamic. There's also, there's things that, that also come into this, but passive income is, is definitely one of them. So even if you bought that property at, at full price, um, Say you bought a, a say you bought a house for a hundred 
thousand um, dollars cash, and you were able to charge um, rent of um, you know thousand or twelve hundred bucks per month. Say by the end of the year, after all of your uh, you know after all of your expenses, your taxes, etc. Say you ended up with um, you know seven thousand dollars in your pocket, right? So seven thousand seven thousand dollars divided by a uh, hundred thousand dollar investment. That's a seven percent return on investment. That's if you pay cash. So in real estate, what one of the things I really li- love about it is this concept of leverage, right? So leverage now can take that you know, that percent, the return on investment that you get in real estate is frequently, um, ta- we talk about it as a cap rate. So all that a cap rate is in commercial property, um, investment property is if you were to buy that property at full price with no loan, no leverage whatsoever, if you took that property and you took the income that you'd derived from that property and divided by how much you pay, that essentially is cap rate in real estate uh, 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 lingo. So anyway, um, so in this situation where I talked about, although in single family houses, we usually don't call it a cap rate, that cap rate here would be, you know, 7% if you get $7,000 for a $100,000 investment. Now, what if you did this? What if you took a loan on that? You took a loan, and all of a sudden you uh, did you put put down twenty five thousand dollars instead of a hundred thousand. You took a, a loan um, of uh, you know at six percent or something like that. Now what? Well, I'm not going to do the numbers here, but your all of a sudden your seven percent return on investment is probably going to be double that. It's probably going to be fourteen percent return on investment. Leveraging always and always increases your return on investment unless the interest rate is higher than the cap rate again that is if you had if 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 your cap rate or the amount cash on cash you would get from this property if you paid cash was 10% if your interest rate that you paid on that loan was below 10 it's going to make you more money if it's, I'm sorry, if it's below 10, it's going to make you money. If that interest rate were higher than 10, then it's going to lose you money. So it's a simple thing to remember. So the other th- concept in the wealth formula, as we've talked about before, is what I'm calling velocity. And I think there's a lot of definitions to this. But what I think of velocity is how quickly am I going to get my money back? Well, if you leverage and you go from, uh, say, for example, you had a 10 cap, 10 uh, capitalization rate, that means it would take you, well, it would take you approximately what? Um, you know, you, you have to use the rule of uh, 72, 72 divided by um, 10. Uh, <clears throat> but you're going to get, if you leverage, you're going to get your money back much quicker because your uh, return on investment or your interest rate to yourself is much higher. So to give you an example, I'm looking at a property right now. And again, I'm looking at properties that cash flow. I don't care that much if I buy a property. uh, If I'm thinking about a property, you know, in an area that I'm hoping is going to go up in value. I I focus on properties that I feel like, you know what, this is an area that's going to be around. There's no reason people are going to move out. For example, in Chicago, there are certain areas that are, you know, right next to areas that are totally gentrified. And they're not going away. Whether or not they pop and all of a sudden take off like some of the neighborhoods in Chicago, I don't know. But right now, they're... They're pretty cheap to get into, and they deliver really high returns on investment. So when I'm looking through properties, I'm looking at um, 
uh, you can go to say like loopnet.com. I use that. That's a site that I look at. Um, it's a, like a commercial property and you can put all sorts of parameters in there and your location and stuff. And one of the things they'll give you on there is cap rate. And again, cap rate is how much money you would make uh, as a percentage cash on cash if you paid full price for that property. So I look at properties on there and I don't even bother if it's a cap rate less than 10. Okay. Because my personal goals, as I mentioned, I don't want to invest in anything that I can't, you know, uh, if I'm going to actually be an active investor, meaning that I'm going to put in all this work and stuff to, you know, make sure every you know, I find the right property and put a right, the right property manager. And I'm not going to invest in anything that gives me less than 15% return on investment. Now, if I look at something with a, a cap rate of 10, if I leverage that, my return on investment, my cash on cash for a year, will probably get close to 20%, depending on the price of the property. So that's how I use that. This is, if this is really, uh, hopefully this isn't confusing, but please leave me questions. Email me <clears throat> on wealthformula.com on that contact, and I'll be happy to tell you all about this. So, going on with the advantages of investment real estate. So, assume you did get a loan, right? So now you've leveraged, you put $25,000 down to buy a $100,000 property. Uh, and so now you're making money because you've got cash flow. You've got more. Uh, you've got more income coming in than the expenses in a given year. And because of your uh, tax advantages, you are deducting the mortgage interest. You are deducting the depreciation. That's all awesome, right? And now you're like ten. You know you're. You're, you're getting a great return on investment that usually you can't rely on in the stock market. But there's underlying things that are making your deal even better. For example, amortization. What is amortization? Most of you probably know, but amortization is basically the concept of you know paying off a mortgage. Okay, So <clears throat> who's paying off your mortgage if you have a mortgage on an apartment building and you're collecting cash flow on a monthly basis. Your tenants, right? So your tenants are the people who are bringing in uh, income, and you're using the money that comes in to pay down that loan. So say, for example, you had a 25-year mortgage. Theoretically, in 25 years, you collected all this cash flow, and you raised rents, etc. And at the end of the deal... At the end of 25 years, all of a sudden you own that property. And it's probably in 25 years, probably quadrupled in value. Although we don't care, right? We don't care about cap rate. We're not really, that's an extra bonus for us. So where else does amortization come in? Well, think about it this way. Now, say you held on, for, you didn't hold on for the 25 years, right? But maybe you held on to it for five or 10 years. So if you leverage that property, you own a lot more of it, right? And so you're going to see the benefit of that when you sell that property because all of a sudden you have all this equity in this property that your tenants paid for. It's awesome, right? The, uh, the last thing I want to talk about in terms of the advantages of real estate. So we talked about depreciation, which is a no-brainer. Right? That's what the government says we get. If we own the investment property, we get to counter depreciation for that. Right? But here's the beauty of it. You get depreciation and then you also get to reap the benefits of any potential appreciation. I want to emphasize that I do not think it's a good idea to invest in real estate surely for the purpose of appreciation. That's why I don't invest in things that are giving me 5% return on investment or 10, you know, even 7% return on investment with the hopes that one day um, they're going to, you know, give me this big waterfall of money because, because it's a, you know, because I speculated. That may or may not happen, but I don't care. I know that if I invest in cash flow, for cash flow, I can do 10% or better. I'm shooting for 15 all the time. 
okay? So that's that's an added bonus. So unbelievable. You get appreciation and depreciation. You get your tenants to pay down your mortgage. You have passive income. I mean, come on. What else could there be, right? This is great. Well, there's even more benefits, actually, because if you sell that property, say you decided to sell that property, you you, you may you do have uh, some issues with regard to uh, paying taxes on the profits and recapturing some of that depreciation. But this is not an issue because of something called a 1031 exchange. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this. This is a very complicated thing that, you know, as long as you know about it, make sure you get an attorney before you sell something. Um, but a 1031 exchange essentially allows you to defer your um, profits, the taxes on, taxes on the profits, uh, almost indefinitely. As long as you reinvest your profits into another like property. So, for example, if you're an apartment building, um, after five years you made a you know two hundred thousand dollar profit. You don't have to pay taxes on that if you invest that back into another apartment building, uh, a bigger one, small you know the same size, whatever. Um, it, it can't be smaller because you can't take any of that money out. You take something the same size, and then you can, if you want to pull liquidity out. You can just basically buy something cash and then refi and pull the cash out. So that's another major, major advantage of, of uh, real estate investing and why I like it. I should point out, too, that my own bias is towards apartment buildings. Why? Well, here's how I take Here's what I think, because... Not everybody agrees with me on this. Real estate investors, you know, you hear about people buying shopping malls and all that stuff. Well, that's not stuff I really do. Uh, you know, uh, my theory is this. People already always have to live somewhere, right? It's sort of recession-proof. In fact, if uh, what we saw in the last five years is that more people are renting now than buying because they can't afford to buy. They can't get the loans to buy. If you're investing in, like, commercial, you know, other things like, say, shopping malls or, you know, uh, office buildings, stuff like that. Well, those are really, really dependent on the economy, right? People don't have to, uh, you know, a, bi a business can easily go out of business, you know, if if the economy goes south. Uh, an office uh, business, uh, you know, if it's an office building, the business in that office building might go out. If it's a strip mall, the strip, the, uh, uh, the economy can go bad and all of a sudden these uh, you know, these businesses that are in those might not be making enough money. So uh, that's why I don't like, I don't, I don't, that's not my preference. I prefer the idea that people have to live somewhere. They're always going to have to live somewhere, no matter what the economy is. And that's why I like multifamily investments, as we call them. Houses uh, are, you know, obviously one family investments, multifamilies, two units uh, or more. Uh, up to apartment buildings and stuff like that. But some people will say, well, I like, um, you know, people move in, move out real quickly. You know, businesses stick around for a long time. There may be some truth to that in a really good economy, but I'd rather not. I'd rather play it safe. And to me, for me, apartment buildings are what I know, what I understand, and, and they make a lot of sense to me. And like I said, I only invest in things that make sense to me. So at this point, you're probably thinking, well, that sounds great, but you know, isn't this all really risky? I mean, after all, you, you heard about what happened in 2008. Well, first of all, um, everything's risky, right? Crossing the street is risky. The stock market is even riskier uh, than, than, than maybe even crossing the street right now. I mean, geez, it's going up and down. No rhyme or reason. The Fed says the economy is doing well, so the stock market goes down. The Fed says the economy is not doing well, the stock market goes up. It, none of this makes sense. So chasing that kind of stuff in my mind is ridiculous. Who 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 understands this? I mean, besides Warren Buffett. Well, I'm not Warren Buffett. The only, uh, by the way, the only uh, the only stock that I own is in my IRA, and I, I'm probably going to liquidate that too. 
uh, to a self-directed IRA, which we'll talk about in another episode. But the only kind of investing that makes sense to me is uh, the type that Warren Buffett does is just value-based investing, buying companies based on what they're worth and, and getting good deals. I don't know enough about that. So put, I put my money into uh, Berkshire Hathaway, which is Warren Buffett's company, because I figure he knows what he's doing. And if I have to put my money somewhere in the stock market because the government dictates that, then it might as well be with Warren Buffett. Um, anyway, getting back to the uh, risk of real estate. Now, if you if you understood, I think, uh, the different kinds of investment in real estate. We talked about capital gains. Uh, flipping houses is the uh, you know the most extreme example of that. That is risky. Of course, it's risky. You're buying something cheap. You're fixing it up and hoping to ride the market and do a you know uh, speculate that you're going to get more money on it. Well, you might. I mean, uh, I have uh, been in that area, and you can you know, end up making thirty percent return in a matter of. You know, two months. It's, it is, but you have to, it has to be calculated, and it has you have to understand that that's more of a business than it is an investment. And if you don't know what you're doing, stay away, okay? Or you know, at least put your money in the hands of something, somebody who you trust and who who is making money. Uh, but don't do that yourself. I think investing in real estate you can you can do yourself if you have the if you want to do it. Uh, it's not that hard. No. You know, we again, we're talking about risk. Now, what if you do nothing? Well, if you're doing nothing, you're actually losing money. You know, uh, inflation uh, is uh, is going to, uh, the fact that inflation is happening and inflation is probably happening at a rate higher than we're, we're accustomed to in the last couple decades uh, means that if you have your money and all you're getting is you know, your 1% interest or whatever in the bank, you are literally losing money on a daily basis. So that's, you know, that's pretty risky, just losing your money. If you put your money in CDs, you may barely get your money back after inflation, the way it's, uh, it's going to turn out. The thing about real estate is it's a highly controllable risk if it's done correctly and if it's done... Uh, and, it, and it's really not that hard to do. Now, you know, there is some, uh, you know, oh, and l- let me address one other risk because one other thing that some of my friends tell me is, hey, you know, I just don't have the time to do this. I don't want tenants calling me. I don't want, you know, people telling me about their, to- their toilets and worrying about, you know, termites and things like that. Well, you don't do this, Right. Um, you don't you don't do this on your on your own. When you buy a property, you hire a property manager, and a property manager basically takes you know it's basically having a, somebody manage your company, right? And a strong property manager, you find out you know who's recommended in your area, uh, is going to keep your property running well. And as long as they do their job. Uh, you're going to come out, you're probably going to come out ahead. I mean, obviously, there's no such thing as guarantee, but uh, that's, that, you know, that's no different for real estate. A property manager is critically important because if a property manager is doing their job correctly, they're going to actually increase rents, make your place a more attractive place uh, by, you know, giving you advice on little things you can do to, you know, improve the property. And, uh, the reason that they are useful also is because they work on a commission. So typically, you know, it depends where you're at, right? But, you know, it may be anywhere from 5 to 12% of gross rent. That's what you're going to pay a property manager. But you work that into your business model. That's not something that happens after you get your 10% return on investment. You have to put this all in. And if you work with a good agent, uh, they will uh, do that spreadsheet for you. And, you know, I mean, listen, Donald Trump owns how much real estate you think he's got, you know, sitting there managing all this stuff. Um, you know, it, it's it's really it's really you have to really think of it as an investment and you can't go cheap on it. You have to make sure that, you know, your investment is well managed. That's all. And, um, you know, you can your broker should be able to tell you who give you some references on that. Um 
What you do need to do, though, if you're going to do this on your own, is you do need to educate yourself. You don't want to be stupid. I mean, I can't tell you. I participate in a number of conferences um, for real estate professionals. In fact, I just got back uh, from one for uh, 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 for real estate syndication, which we'll talk about in another show, which is basically you know group investments uh, on real estate, which I participate in and actually um, will even sponsor, have even sponsored. So the thing here is that um, you have to have either you have to have some knowledge or you have to invest your money with some somebody with knowledge. It, it's not really complicated. I mean, honestly, uh, a lot of it is just common sense. Investing in areas that are, you know, not likely to, um, you know, lose their entire economy because of one company. Uh, you have to look at some demographics. Make sure there's people moving into the area instead of moving out. And after that. If you stick to the concept that you're really after cash flow, you really want to make sure that you get a good return on your investment just by the rent. Don't think about what's going to happen, you know, if that property is going to be worth three times as much in, in five years. It might, but that'll be a pleasant surprise. Just make sure you you clear that bar of, of, of making sure you get out way ahead. That's my philosophy. And again... I don't want to be liable for any of this. So this disclaimer is I'm giving you all my opinions and what's worked for me and what what has worked for my my own father who, you know, has literally owned hundreds and hundreds of units at any given time. Now, he came here about 45, almost 50 years ago. And after about five years as a civil engineer, uh, just started investing in real estate. Here's a guy who's coming out of a com completely different country. And he comes to the U.S. and he decides, hey, this real estate stuff really makes a lot of sense. So I, you know, he starts out by buying the, you know, the duplex that he and my mother lived in. And, hey, I'm living for free. Maybe I should do this and collect more. All of a sudden, it just really made sense to him. So he learned the, a little bit about the city he lived in and, you know, built one uh, investment after another, never worried about speculation, just kind of slowly and gradually built, you know, put in, put in certain money, got, got an extra, you know, 10 grand, to, 10 grand a year from this, an extra 20 grand a year from that. And before you know it, we're talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, per year, uh, over a million per year in ca some cases. Um, just from years and years of simple, basic investing, income exceeds expenses. It's just, it's just addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, multiplication, not even hard math and common sense. Now, if you still don't feel comfortable with this, which I understand it's, you know, it's, it's not something that everybody has time to say, okay, I'm going to read a few books about real estate. I'm going to understand this, maybe take a course or two. Um, and if you, by the way, if you do those, I think you'll realize the same thing that it's not that hard. But if you don't want to do this, if you just don't want to do this, you can still invest in real estate. I mean, you can invest in real estate uh, securities, for example. I mean, there are what are called REITs, R-E-I-T's. Um, they're basically, you know, these trusts that uh, manage properties and they're traded just like any other stock. I'm not a huge fan of those because, you know, the in return on investment is not great. Some of them are speculation type REITs, which I'm not real into either, but it's something to consider. Another option um, is, frankly, is to get involved with some of these you know, some of these uh, group syndicated opportunities. For example, you know, I mean, if you look at like uh, major purchases of, of real estate, most of the time they're happening by, by what are called syndicates. What's a syndicate? It's basically a, um, you know, it's, it's essentially, uh, you know, just a group of people who come together and pooling money with a sponsor who basically manages the whole deal, knows what he or she is doing. And there's a, some kind of profit split and residual income. So 
that actually is a great opportunity. And you're going to hear a lot more about this, um, you know, after September 23rd, uh, 2013, because there's all sorts of rules and regulations about this kind of stuff that are uh, changing uh, as of 2013. So if you're if you make a lot of money and somebody knows you make a lot of money, you may get some solicitations for various things like hedge funds, etc., that you never understood. You might be like, well, where were you all this time, right? Well, that's because some of the laws are changing about advertising, etc. So anyway, why would you do something like this as opposed to a REIT? Well, frankly, it's just because the returns are better. And I've invested in some of these private uh, things and, um, you know, to give you an idea of one of the uh, deals that one of the deals that um, I was talking to um, a uh, fund manager about recently was basically putting in a certain amount of money. The idea was that they were going to um, uh, pay back uh, an 8 percent um, um, uh, preferred rate to the investors, which what that means is the eight percent back on the investment before the other guy sees anything, and um, <clears throat> and then the the business plan which they showed me showed that you know the plan was to really s- strengthen the <clears throat> the property by investing um, uh, investing in um, you know good management, getting those apartments filled. And then ultimately refinancing at around year three to give all the investors all their money back. And at the same time, maintaining a uh, sort of an infinite return on investment after that. So these kinds of deals are out there. That's the kind of deal that when I hear about, that's when I'll, I'll, I'll definitely get, you know, if I, if, I, if I have the liquidity, I'll definitely get interested in something like that. Obviously, you have to know who you're investing with and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, you just have to, uh, I think you have to get interested in this stuff and at least have some people who you can talk to once in a while about what they're doing. Um, I'm happy uh, to, you know, to share any of the uh, the things that I'm doing on my own, my own investments. I'm, one of the, the stuff I just talked about is not anything that I'm, uh, I'm only on it as an investor. I'm not doing anything else on on that, I don't own any of that fund or anything, but I'll be happy to tell anybody about things that I know about that are great opportunities. There are also great opportunities outside of real estate, um, for example, oil and natural gas, etc. But you know, keep your options open. Make sure you talk to people who know a little bit about this stuff. And most of us uh, professionals who are doing a lot of, uh, who are making a good living, etc are too busy to really know about a lot of this stuff. People assume we do. Uh, Like at this syndication conference conference I was at, it was funny because I was the only guy there who was not a mortgage broker. And everybody got up and and told what they did for a living. And I said, I got got up and told them I was a surgeon. And everybody looked at me like, you know, (laughs) they couldn't believe I was there. But, you know, I mean, we have to educate ourselves. We have to know what's going on. And and if uh, it can be really fun. Um, so anyway, I hope you have enjoyed uh, this, um, you know, this particular episode of Wealth Formula podcast. I believe there is ways to give us some, uh, give me uh, some good uh, feedback, and one of them is by giving a five star rating on iTunes. I know everybody says that, but at least uh, get the message out to more people because people won't even see that the podcast is available unless there's a lot of five stars out there. Tell your friends about it too. If you are, you know, a podcast listener, um, you're a physician, lawyer, whatever, you don't know about some of these things, um, then, you know, uh, tell people about the podcast, uh, get, get listening. We'll, at some point we'll, uh, we'll definitely, you know, maybe have some phone calls and talk about stuff and, uh, webinars, etc. I have some great guests on that, you know, I had an opportunity to meet at various times. I think there's a lot of great people out there who I think uh, a lot of a lot of you who are interested in um, sort of the non-traditional investing uh, like this um, are going to be really excited about. 
I told you that one of the things I was going to do on every show was try to give you one sort of little educational piece. Um, and so today what I wanted to tell you about was something that I think is most people don't know. And I mentioned it a little bit earlier. But you don't have to keep your money, your IRA money, in a, uh, you know, in, in the stock market. So, you know, <clears throat> the government has mandated that the traditional IRA investments are essentially in the stock market or CDs, things like that. But <clears throat> the reality is that you can, if you want to, invest on your own. Uh, and this is called a self-directed IRA, and there are companies out there that will allow you to do this. There are companies, so what you, What can you do this? Well, can you invest in real estate? Absolutely, you can. Can you invest if you are, uh, you know, accredited as an accredited investor? Um, could you invest into a, a, a fund, like a hedge fund or a syndicate of sorts with your IRA? Could you invest into an IPO with your IRA if you have the accreditation? Absolutely, you can. And this is something that most people don't know. It's not a big surprise either, right? Because, who? I mean, the, the banks control everything and they have all the money. They don't want you to know all this stuff. But you could buy an investment home, uh, a home to rent out with your IRA. You could put $25,000 into a syndicate that's buying real estate and reap the benefits of that. These are all things that are out there for you. And if you've got an IRA that's just smoldering into, you know, by, you know, that's not really doing much, um, invested in the stock market by some some kid who graduated college and took a six-month course in, you know, wealth management, then, then, uh, then maybe you ought to consider this. Again, it's something that I'd love to talk to you about. Send me your questions. At some point, I'm going to put some uh, uh, stuff on here that will allow you to actually uh, send me your questions um, via voice, and we'll play those, etc. Anyway, thanks for listening. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit me at uh, wealthformula.com if you want some basic financial education as well. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.